Hey, you could go ahead and grab a seat. If we could do a favor, if you are a young, able-bodied person, would you mind doing me a really big solid this evening? Would you come sit at the front in the altars? We have some other uh, senior saints and people who are unable to get a seat right now. Let's be able to honor those who are um, elders in our house and come and make space for those. Uh, so that way we also have people in the lobby right now who are unable to find a seat. That looks good. So we're able to make room now. Everybody can fill in. All right, come on, come on. Hey, thank y'all so much. Isn't this a good problem to have? Come on. When I, when I read the book of Acts, like we're studying right now, this is kind of what I imagine a little bit of it's like. People just huddled in, in that upper room moment and just praying and believing God to do what only God can do, amen. It's a, it is amazing to see uh, how the prayer night is going. And so, hey, we're in a study on First Wednesdays over the Holy Spirit. You know, the Lord actually in the month of July of last year uh, began to speak not only to my heart, but also to the hearts of those who are in our, uh, our prayer team. And it all just kind of synced together. I was originally supposed to be teaching First John uh, this year. And then I had another sermon series that I had planned for, for First Wednesdays. And the Lord just put it in my heart. He said, I want you to teach people about the Holy Spirit. I want you to begin to teach your church about the Holy Spirit. And I came back from our vacation and uh, I told that to Didi and Didi told me the same thing and our hearts just lined up. And as we can see, God is blessing our obedience, amen. Um, whenever the Holy Spirit is given the space and the room to move, that's when a church begins to experience God in ways that it had never experienced before. And so I'm super excited. We're gonna be studying the Holy Spirit. I know some of you, you this might be new for you because you know, maybe you've never heard of the Holy Spirit or maybe you thought the Holy Spirit was kind of like Star Wars the Force uh, or something like that. Like it's just this like ethereal being like floating around. Uh, or maybe some of you grew up in different traditions where you were taught the Trinity was the Father, Son, Holy Bible. And so uh, you didn't get a whole lot of teachings around the Holy Spirit. Or maybe you're like me and you grew up in a tradition where there was an emphasis on the Holy Spirit to the point to where it really just got out of hand and out of control. And there were some abuses that happened into that. And so what we're trying to do is bring everybody in unity around the teachings of the Holy Spirit, uh, who he is, what he does, and why we need him. You know, there was actually, Actually, about uh, a few months ago, there was a, uh, I got a kind of a complaint. I know y'all would never imagine um, a, a church folk complaining, uh, but I had a person who complained. And one of the things they said was that if this church gets more charismatic, I'm leaving. Um, and they are not here anymore. Um, but as you can tell, God has continued to grow and bring what God is doing. And... And, and here's, what I, here's what I have to say to that is like the day and age that we live in, we need more Holy Spirit, not less. Like when you survey our society, when you turn on the news, when you look around our community, when you see the, the needs that are happening, not only just in America, but around the world, I can't help but say, we need more of the Holy Spirit in our lives, not less. People say, why do I need the Holy Spirit? You don't need the Holy Spirit just to go to church. You need the Holy Ghost to go to Walmart. Come on, somebody, right? We need the Holy Spirit in our lives. And here's the idea that I wanna talk to you about tonight is about the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, I've just kind of came to a conclusion for myself that I'm tired of being cool. I'm tired of trying to be hip. I'm try tired of trying to be relevant. What I want is I, I want what God wants. I just want what God wants for my life. And, and I've just told myself this over and over, and I've just, when it comes to the teachings of the Holy Spirit, I know it can get a little, um, it can get a little confusing, you dive in deep, and, but I, I just came to, this, to this, uh, this, in my heart, here's what I believe, if God has it, I want it. Yeah. That's just where I'm at at this stage in my life. If God has it, I want it. Like, do you believe that God is good? Yes. Okay, then, then if God has something for us, then it must also be what? Good. And if God has it, I want it. Whatever God has, I want it. I, I don't want to diminish what God wants to do in my life. I don't want to control what God wants to do in my life. I want to see God do what only he can do. And so my heart and my disposition when it comes to first Wednesdays, Sundays, when it comes to prayer or Bible study, whatever it may be, like if God has it, I want it. And that's one of the deep convictions I've been feeling as we're studying through the book of Acts is I read the book of Acts and I'm like, man, they have something that I'm missing. Like, do you ever just read the Bible and realize like, like 
I, the church in America or, or my life and I, I see what's written in the pages of this book and I'm just like, something's, something's off. Like, like I know we're meant for more than just to show up at church on Sunday and go to a small group and be on a serve team and that's it. That's all the Christian life has to offer for me. I read the book of Acts and I, I see the, the salvations, the baptisms, the revival. I see the miracles that break out all around and I look at my life and I look at the lives of, of others in our, in our nation and the churches in America. And I'm like, we're missing something. Does anybody ever just feel like there must be more to the Christian life than what you're experiencing? And here's the reason why. It's because there is more to the Christian life than what we are currently experiencing. And if that's true, then we have to be able to receive from God what God has for us. And that starts with us opening our hearts and saying, okay, God, whatever it is, I want it. If it's from you, I want it. And that's why we're gonna talk tonight about what it's called the power of, of the Holy Spirit. If you have your Bibles, we're in Acts chapter one. We've been studying this for the last four or five weeks here at the church uh, in our Acts series. And we're gonna look a little bit more in detail uh, around the subject of the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus actually, he tells the disciples this following the resurrection before the ascension. He says this in Acts 1, 4. He says, while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait. Circle that word. We're gonna come back to it. For the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. You're gonna see that word come up in various Forms. So you're going to hear baptism of the Spirit. You're going to hear being poured out in the Spirit. You're going to hear being filled with the Spirit. And we see another one in Luke 24, 49. Behold, I am sending the promise, same words, same author. Jesus says, the promise of my Father, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power on high. So there's baptism, there's filling of the Spirit, there's being clothed with power. It's all synonymous, speaking of this same event. And then he says this in Acts 1, 8. But you you will receive, what's the word? Power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Tonight, I wanna to talk to you about the power of the Holy Spirit. I, I love that it says this word here, that you will be my, my witnesses. That word witness is martuso. It's the same way word we get in the Greek for the word martyr. What it means is you're gonna give your life for my sake. That's what it means. You will be my witnesses. You're gonna lay down your life and you are going to live on mission to be able to reach people in, in, for me, to build the kingdom of God, to continue to, to share your faith with others, to, to pray and to believe God, to move in mighty ways. You are gonna be my, my martyrs. You're gonna, you're gonna spread the gospel. You're gonna preach the good news. You're gonna lay down your life. You're gonna to die to yourself. You're gonna put the needs of others above the needs of your own, the needs of the kingdom and the king above the needs of yourself. You are going to lay down your life for this. That's what it means to be a Christian, guys. It means that Jesus above all, Jesus is king of all. We, we lay it all down at the feet of Jesus and we follow him wherever he leads, wherever he goes, whatever he tells us to do. And the way in which we do that is we need to receive the power of the Holy Spirit to live the authentic Christian life. I, I was thinking about it just the other day because me and my daughters, we went outside and uh, we had some leftover firecrackers. And so we, we decided, we were like, hey, we wanna go pop some fireworks. And, and one of the things that we had was these little poppers, right? You ever, you ever seen these little poppers, right? They just go like this, right? Little poppers, you, ever, you know what those are, right? Yeah, these are pretty fun when you have little kids, right? And so we were just kind of playing games and we we're just popping them on the ground. And this is what Jesus says. He says, you will receive what? Power. But whenever I look at the church, I don't really see in our church, I'll just speak of our church, I don't really see power, at least not in the way the Bible says. Like not in the fullness. What I see is little pops. Right? This is what, this is what I, I think we've had and praise God for what we've received so far because it's still fun. It's still enjoyable. Like it's still making a difference in memories, right? But we're seeing like little pops, but we're not seeing yet the fullness of power. Here, here's what it looks like. It's like, man, first Wednesday's packed. Awesome. Okay, great. I invited somebody to church yesterday and they said yes. All right. <laughs> got a pop. Okay. I prayed out loud in small group for the first time. 
right? And what I think is like, it's like, oh, hey, you know, like my friend came to, and they went down to, for prayer. They raised their hand for salvation. We got another baptism, another baptism, and then another one. We got 30 baptisms just a few weeks ago. Oh man, we are at two services. No, we're at three services. Now we're at four services. Oh, coming up next is five services. <laughs> We're at first Wednesday. Get ready for second Wednesday. <laughs> and, and you know, like, but this is fine, right? This is fine. Like, we, we've got pops. Praise God for that. But I believe that there's a day coming, and it's very soon, that we will not just have pops of God's move, but we will have power <laughs> of God's move. See, I believe that this is what God envisions for us. It's not just little pops, but God wants power for the church. When the Spirit of the Lord comes upon you, you don't just get pops. You get the power of God on display in the church. And here's what I believe. I believe there is a day coming, and it starts in our hearts. And I want you to know this, that God has more in store for his church. God wants more for the church. Like there is no plan B. The local church is the plan A of the world. It is the way in which we are to be his witnesses everywhere we go to everyone we meet to share the hope and the glory of the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are the, the witnesses the world has. And I believe that God has more in store for us. Do you believe that there is more that God desires for our church? More souls, more salvations, more disciples, more lives changed, more baptisms. Well, if we want to experience the, 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 the more that God has in store, then we need to receive the power that is promised to us by, the Holy, by Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And so what I want to do today, because we're getting into Pentecost next week, we're going to start Acts chapter 2, and, and then my friend Jason Mayfield is going to come preach at First Wednesday in the month of June. He's an evangelist. He, he focuses on uh, the baptism of the Spirit, and so we're going to just be getting us all geared up and ready for this. But what I want to do today is I just want to, I want to inspire you to pray for power from God. I want to give you four, five reasons why, five, yes. I want to give you five reasons why we need power. Why do you, why, why does Jesus say wait? He said, listen to this. These are the disciples. They've spent three years with Jesus, JCU, Jesus Christ University. Like they know him better than anybody else. They've seen him preach, teach, heal, cast out demons, perform miracles, walk on water. They've seen it all. And whenever he says, hey, you're gonna be my witnesses, he doesn't say, go out and get started right now. He says, wait, because you're not ready yet. You need something more. You need, you need the Holy Spirit. Right. You need the power, clothed with power. You need the Holy Spirit. And I think if the disciples were not yet ready to do ministry, then why do we think we can go out and be his witnesses without the power? If the disciples need it, we need it as well. And I want to inspire you tonight, uh, reasons why you should pray for the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. The, the first reason is that we pray for the power to be able to be witnesses. That's what he says. You will be my what? Witnesses. Look what happens here as an overview of the book of Acts. Acts 4.31. When they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. There's the word. And they continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Like how many of you wish you were just more bold? Like you want to share your faith in person and not just in the comment section on Facebook, right? How many of you wish you were just more bold, like at work and a coworker's talking and they're like, hey, you know, I, I'm going through this right now. And you're like, man, I really wish I could just tell them about Jesus. Or you just pull out an invite card. Like that's the boldest you got. You got an invite card. That's as bold as you get. Or maybe it's a family member who maybe they've turned their back on the Lord or, you know, they're believing progressive woke ideology and you're sitting at the dinner table and you're like, hey, let me just try to tell you of some sanity about Jesus and the way the world works. And, and you're, but you're scared. You're terrified. I, I think a lot of us, we have been so beaten down by the culture war. We've given up on the spiritual war that's happening. Wow. And, and so there's a timidity that has come over us because we're afraid to share. How many of you, you're just like, I wish I could be a little bit more bold. Anybody wish you were more bold? Listen, here's the thing. You don't pray for boldness. Right. Don't pray for boldness. Don't pray to be bold. Pray to be filled. Because, because, because boldness is a byproduct of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Yes. 
That's what it says here. They prayed, they were filled with the spirit and they preached with boldness. Like boldness is a byproduct. Do not pray, God, make me bold. No, pray, God, make me filled, fill me up. And then boldness follows the filling of the Holy Spirit. And so the more you wanna be bold, that's the more you need to be filled. Like we need to be his witnesses because there's people that you know and love who do not yet know and love Jesus. And the reality is, unless we reach them, there is an eternal stake that is at, uh, gave, there's, there's eternity that's on the line. There, heaven and hell are very real and everybody spends eternity somewhere. And so we need to be bold when it comes to our witnesses and bold when it comes to sharing our faith. When we come to inviting people, not just to church, but into the kingdom of God, it requires a level of boldness. And so if you're timid and if you're afraid and you're not witnessing or sharing your faith, I have to ask you, are you sure that you've been filled with the spirit of God? Because there is a boldness that comes upon believers when they're being filled with the Spirit of God. We're to be his witnesses. The, the second thing is this, is that there's power for signs and wonders. Look what it says here in Acts 5.12. Now, many signs and wonders, so the story continues, were being re done regularly by the people, among the people, by the hands of the apostles. Listen, when you're filled with the Spirit, the power of God, the supernatural becomes normal yes. for us. Like when we pray, we see answers to prayers. Like when you, when you pray for healing or you pray for miracles, when you, when you pray for breakthrough, and you're not shocked or surprised when God does it because you've seen it do it before and you're gonna believe in faith that he's gonna continue to do it and he's gonna do it again. And, and signs and wonders follow those who believe. Now listen, at Redemption Church, we are not a signs and wonders chasing church. We don't chase signs and wonders because here's what we believe, that as we follow Jesus, signs and wonders follow us. Okay, here's the reason why. It's because it's called a sign. A miracle, a healing is a sign. What, is, what do signs do? Signs point to something. The miracles only confirm the message of what we're preaching. That's the, pur pur that's the purpose of miracles. They confirm the message. Jesus performed signs and wonders to confirm the message of the kingdom of God. The apostles go out, they, they, they perform signs and wonders because there is a message that is being confirmed by the miracle. What is the message that we preach? That Jesus Christ lived, died, rose, and Jesus and Jesus alone transforms and changes lives. How can we show that to a world? Not only through our words, but also through our deeds, through our prayers, answered prayers, signs and wonders about what God has done in their lives. And so we, we need to see this, listen. And, and here's a quote that I enjoy that's just really stuck out to me. And this is so important. It says this, the spirit is in you for your sake, but comes upon you for the sake of others. Wow. Okay, let me, let me explain this. Every single Christian, the moment of salvation is automatically indwelt by the spirit. Romans 12:1 says, nobody can say Jesus is Lord, but by the Holy Spirit. The, the book of Romans talks about how we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, right? So the moment you are saved, you are, you are indwelt by the Spirit, but there's a, op there's a second opportunity where the Spirit comes upon you, not in you, but upon you, like we read, upon you with an anointing to be able to do what you never could do before, to be able to witness and to reach and to be able to see answer to prayers. The Spirit is in you for your sake. He leads you, guides you, he, he loves you, he can confirms you. He, he seals you in salvation, but the spirit comes upon you, not for your sake, but for the sake of others, to be able to be a witness and to be able to reach others. And so we need to see it for signs and wonders. The, the third thing is the power for wisdom. Acts 6, 2, and the 12, some of the full number and disciples said, it is not right. Every pastor loves this verse. Listen to this. It is not right that we should give up preaching the word to serve tables. Okay. Therefore, brothers, pick out among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit. And then there's a clarifying, full of wisdom, wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty, but we will instead devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. You know, there's a, a difference between knowledge and wisdom. Yeah. Okay, here, here's the difference. Knowledge is knowing that a tomato is a fruit, but wisdom is not putting it in a fruit salad. <laughs> See, here's the difference is, is knowledge is information, wisdom is application. I would even go a step further that wisdom is revelation. Yeah. It's receiving wisdom that is supernatural, that is outside of yourself, and then applying it to a certain situation to be able to see a miraculous move in ways that you could never accomplish. Listen, this is a story of, this is a story of the prayer meeting at Redemption. 
I know I tell this story all the time. Sometimes people ask, why do you keep repeating that story? I, I repeat it the same way that the Israelites repeated their bondage in, in Egypt because I never want our church to forget what God has done in our, our lives. Listen, here's the story. For three years, we spun our wheels trying to grow a church through marketing, through advertisements, through, through pop signs and parking teams and Instagram and, and Facebook. And I went to all the conferences. I read all the blogs and books. I put all the effort in. We spent thousands upon thousands of dollars in training and all this stuff. And our church was still stuck. And there was, I just got frustrated. It's like, God, why is our church not growing? And he said, Byron, it's because you're not praying. You're not a praying church. Teach your church how to pray and then watch and see what I'll do. Listen, here's wisdom. Wisdom is this. It's the difference between a good idea and God's ideas. Right? That, that's what it is. That you can have all of the information in the world, but if you don't have the wisdom of God, it doesn't mean anything because there's no revelation attached to it. There's no inspiration that's attached to it. And there will be no application that is going to help people experience life change that only comes through Jesus. We need to have wisdom. What is he doing? The church is growing rapidly. 5,000 people in just a few months got saved at the church of Acts. And Peter and the rest of the apostles, they're burning themselves out. They're spinning their wheels. They're tired and they're they're, they're exhausted and they say, hey, we need to preach the word and pray. So we need to find some wise men to get in here, but filled with the spirit, with wisdom, so they can begin to scale out this organization. And I love systems. I love programs. But what I love more is spirit power. That's what we need more and more of as a church. It's not just systems. We need the spirit to be able to breathe through those systems. We don't just need programs, but we need power working through those programs to be able to see what God wants to do in our church. We need, we need wisdom. Listen, in, in, the, in the day and age that we live in, there's a lot of people who know a lot, but we're still not getting a lot done. When it comes to our nation, when it comes to our society, there's little great, there's great systems. Like, like for me, I love being an American. I, 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 love, I, I love my country and I, I, I want to be able to be a citizen here. And I, I believe that we should play our part and we should vote this, uh, this Saturday is, the, is voting here in Southeast Texas for our mayor and for our, our city council at large and our BISD school boards and all those different things. I believe as Christians, we have a, a civic responsibility to do that, but do not let the government take the place of God in our country. Don't just believe that, that the government's gonna handle it. No, we pray for wisdom that comes from God so that way we not only cast a vote, but we also raise our voice. I mean, when you look around our society, how are we going to be able to see gospel transformation in our city? I looked it up this week and, and you know, several years ago, Beaumont was reported as the saddest city in America. Right? We, need, we need wisdom to be able to bring healing and, and restoration and change to this. I looked it up according to one website, Beaumont, Texas is the 44th most dangerous metropolitan city in America. 10 out of every 10,000 or one out of 1,000 people will be a victim of a violent crime here in Beaumont, Texas. There's a growing case of overdoses of fentanyl in our region. What we see is that 25% of the people who live in Beaumont live below the poverty line. And then we also know if you're a parent, our BISD school systems, man, they need more than just knowledge. They need men and women filled with wisdom yes. to be able to lead well. Listen, when we think about our society, we, 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 we need the wisdom of God. Like we, we don't just need programs, guys. We need power. We don't, we don't just need more church services. We need men and women who are filled with the spirit of God being sent out into their communities, into their schools, into their jobs, into their workplaces, into government organizations. We need men and women filled with the spirit of God outside of the walls of these churches to be able to reach into our community, to bring real life change through Jesus and transformation because we can't just expect everybody to come through the doors of the church. We need a church that rises up and not only gets people people to come, but to go and to be his witnesses in our community. Guys, we need wisdom, not just more church services where we can get information into our head, but we need the wisdom of God to bring application into our communities and into our homes about the, the gospel transformation that we see. I believe it's time, guys, that we stop playing church and start being the church. In order to do that, it, it can't just be, hey, how can we get people in the doors? It's got to be, hey, how do we raise people up and send them out into our city? And that comes from the, the wisdom of the power of God in a church. And that leads to number five as, the, as we get ready to, to go into prayer, the worship team's gonna come up, is, it's the power to worship. Look what it says here in, in Acts 2.40. Um, it, it says, sorry about this. Um, 
Let's see, uh, Acts 10, 44, it says this. While Peter was saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all that heard, right? And so this is what we see. Um, the baptism of the Spirit, the outpouring of the Spirit, the falling upon the Spirit, clothed in power. And the believers from among the circumcision who had come with Peter, they were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles, for they were hearing them speak in tongues and extolling God. Okay, listen, next week we're gonna, this Sunday we're gonna talk about the Pentecost moment and we're gonna talk about tongues. But for now, let me just go ahead and say, get that out of your head. Don't even think about it right now because when it comes to receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit, people get all obsessed. They're like, tongues, what about tongues, right? Don't even think about it because Jesus in Acts 1.8 never said anything about tongues. They weren't expecting tongues. The disciples weren't expecting tongues. So let's, people get all caught up. They're like, well, if I baptize in spirit, does that mean I'm automatically speaking tongues? And then they get afraid because they're thinking about other sermons. Listen, that's not what we're talking about here. We just wanna receive the power of God. We just wanna receive the power of God. If tongues comes with it, praise the Lord for that. And we'll talk about that in a little bit, but we just wanna see the power. And, and why do we wanna see the power? Here, here's the reason why. It's because we wanna have the power to worship. What, is that? what does that mean? It says they were extolling, they were worshiping, they were praising, they were giving glory to God. Like that's what we want as a church. We just wanna be a church that is so filled with the spirit of God that we are not satisfied with anything else. That's it. They're just extolling the glory. God, you are so good. God, you are so amazing. God, you are so wonderful. They're filled with the spirit and they overflow with praise and they start singing out to the glory of God. Hallelujah, I worship you. We magnify you, we praise you. And there was a overflowing worship, despite their circumstances, despite their situations, despite what they were going through, what they had been taught, what they had heard. All of a sudden they were filled with the spirit and they're overflowing with praise and they begin to extol God. Listen, that's my heart for us as a church. Like I would just love to see a church where we're so filled with the spirit that we are not satisfied by anything else. G the, the Ten Commandments says that the first of the Ten Commandments is you shall have no other God but me. What is that? That's a worship. And how many of us have other gods besides God? Where we're, where we're seeking our fulfillment and our satisfaction in, in relationships or in our job or in our kids or in sex or in our gender. Or what, what are we after in money and greed and fame? It's holding you back from living in the fullness of God because you're so easily satisfied with things that will never have any eternal value for you. And so what we need to do is be filled with the spirit. And as we are filled with spirit, don't be surprised because tongues will happen and worship will happen. And these things will begin to flow flow out of your life. But what we need to focus on is the giver, not just the gift. Because as we just focus on that one area of aspect, it binds you up. It, it, it causes fear and anxiety inside of you. No, here's what we want to focus on. We want to focus just on worshiping God. And as we begin to worship God, when the praises go up, the blessings go down. When the praises go up, the power of God comes down in our lives. And here's the last thing that I want to encourage you with. If you want to receive not just pops of God's grace, but you want to receive the power that God has for you, it only comes from prayer. That prayer is what unlocks the power of God in your life. If you want to see God move in mighty ways, it starts with you, with you praying and, and seeking the Lord because that's how it happened in Acts chapter one. He said, you will receive power, but wait, wait. And what do they do? For 10 days, they're in a prayer meeting. And they're waiting, and they're waiting, and they're waiting, and they're waiting, and they're praying, and they're seeking God, and they're worshiping, just like we're doing in this room right now. They're waiting, and they're waiting, and waiting, and then it happened. Some of you are discouraged when it comes to this idea of the baptism of the Spirit and the power of God because you prayed for it once, and it didn't happen, and so you gave up, and you walked away because you thought maybe it's not for you. Listen, here, here's, here's what it, it says here. It says, in the last days... Peter stands up and quotes the prophet Joel. He said, he will pour his spirit out on all flesh. Amen. This gift is available for all. It's available for you. You will receive power. If it was true for them, it's true for us. So what is our response in the midst of all this? Well, we do what Jesus said we do. We wait and we wait and we wait and we pray. And the more we pray, the more of God's power we'll see in our church.